Yeah, so last time uh, we, we, uh, we left, left, left off with a sort of summary of user interface security. And we talked about how it's, um, it's an attack on human perception. And we should just sort of admit that it's going to happen. Um, and rather than uh, handicapping the browser, we would prefer to um, have an additional layer of security that helps us out when we end up on a sketchy site. So there's um, a system devised by Google called Google Safe Browsing. How many people have heard of this? OK, a couple people. Um, how many people have seen the warning page when you go to a site where the browser is warning you you don't want to proceed, but you can like proceed if you want to, right? Yeah, OK, more people have seen that. So the idea is Google's maintaining a list of known malware and phishing URLs. And if we could query that list before visiting a URL and check to see if a site has been reported as a phishing page or as a page that uh, you know, is going to have some kind of unexpected behavior, then we could warn the user before they go to that page. And so one downside of, of like a naive approach to this would be we would be sending our real-time browsing data to this third party every time we're about to visit a page. So there's, uh, there's two downsides I can think of to this. One is you're giving your entire browsing history to whatever service, in this case, Google, uh, you know, before you actually load the URL. And the second issue is that you're introducing latency, because now you can't actually start to load the page um, until you've heard back from this service and confirmed that the URL is indeed safe. So we need a better way. And so Another, another idea is maybe we should just download a giant list of all these suspicious URLs, and our browser can check this list before loading, um, loading a URL, and that will be a little bit faster, because we'll have the list locally. But the downside is this list is constantly changing, and it's also going to be ginormous. Uh, so we can come up with something better. Um, so what we can do is, uh, actually, I guess I was going to show a demo of what it looks like, just uh, in case fo some folks haven't seen um, what uh, what this looks like. So we can go to this page here. And so these are just various types of uh, uh, warnings that the browser might throw up. So if you want to see, like, this is a, a phishing warning. Um, and if you want to bypass it, you can actually uh, click that and then click this visit unsafe site link. Um, but there's also there's a, there's a bunch of other types of warnings you might get. Um, how do I go back? So there's a malware warning, which is slightly different. The site ahead contains malware. There's one for um, uh, unwanted software. So this is like if uh, a page is serving downloads, which are bundled with other software that you might not want, like software that shows you ads, or software that, um, I don't know, mines cryptocurrency in the background, um, then you'll, you'll get this warning. And then this is one that I think is very interesting. This, this is introduced more recently. Um, there's, there are sites that try to um, claim that they're providing a free service. Um, and they might ask for your mobile number, and then you type your mobile number in, and then they somehow uh, charge your mobile number, and you'll see a, a charge on your bill um, because you actually agreed to some sort of sort of paid service, and them just knowing your phone number is somehow enough to get this onto your onto your bill. Um, and so, uh, in this situation, technically, like in theory, you may actually want some service like this, uh, but if the page is sufficiently uh, uh, sketchy about how it how it discloses this to you, then it gets put onto a list that shows you this, which I think is a pretty funny warning. Uh, the page ahead may, charge, may try to charge you money. <laughs> it's not really saying that you know, anything necessarily bad will happen. Just be, be aware that the claims that the service is free may not be actually true. Um, but yeah, anyway, so there's these lists of URLs that we can, um, we can look up. Um, yeah, so, uh, so basically, this is quite useful. Um, but uh, again, we don't want to, uh, to query a central service every time we, we need to look this up. So there's a better way. So there's this, um, oh, well, yeah, this is actually the sort of the, the, the naive way to do it. Um, they provide an API where you can literally ask it if a URL is safe. Um, and it's a simple post request that you make, and it's going to return basically the state of the URL, whether it's safe or if it's unsafe, and then sort of what is, you know, why is it unsafe uh, if it is unsafe. But of course, the drawbacks are, your URLs that you're sending to the service are, are sort of in the clear, and the server knows exactly what URL you're looking up. And also, the response time issue I mentioned, where um, you're waiting for the, the service to tell you whether the URL is safe or not before you actually start to load it. Um, so there's a better API that they provide called the Update API. The idea here is instead of uh, exchanging, instead of telling the server uh, the URL, you, you in advance download a list of uh, hash prefixes. And 
essentially, so what, what, uh, what, what Google is doing is when it sees a suspicious URL that's reported to it, it will take that URL and hash it. And I'll, mention, I'll review hashes just in case anyone's forgotten. But basically, it produces some value. And then it's going to take um, the entire set of hashes that it's produced and chop off sort of the, the end half and take the prefixes and send that down to all the browsers. So every browser has a list of prefixes of these hashes. And what we do to check to see if uh, a URL is safe or not is we hash it ourselves in exactly the same way that Google did when we chop off the, the, you know, the beginning and just take the prefix and we look and see if it's in the list. Um, and if it's in the list, then it means that uh, it may be unsafe, uh, but it may not be. Um, and so let me just, let me just go, go through, walk through what, 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 it will, what it will look like and we can see what actually is going on here. Um, yeah, I, should have, I should have done this in another order. Um, but yeah, so let's quickly review uh, cryptographic hash functions. Um, uh, just, just so I can get an idea, raise your hand if, if you're familiar with, with this concept. OK, there's still a few people. Because 155 is not a prereq for this class, so I'll just quickly review this. Um, so it's an algorithm that can take data of sort of any size. You put it through this function, and out you get what we call a hash value. And we want certain properties from hash functions in order for them to be useful to us. So, so one thing is we want um, them to be one way. So we, we want, given sort of the hash value that comes out of the function, you can't very easily get back the value that was passed in uh, to, to produce that, that value. So they're one way. And we, wanna be, we want, want it to be the case that if we hash the same value twice, we get the same hash value out. Um, and then we also want it to be relatively quick to compute because we want to be doing this operation relatively often. Um, and we also don't want it to be possible to, to come up with an input that um, produces a, a specific hash value. Um, and lastly, we, we want sort of a small change to an input to cause a ginormous change in the output. Um, so these properties are, are, are um, pr produce sort of a primitive that's quite useful. So let's see how we might use this um, in this protocol here. So, so first step is the client, this is your browser, is going to make a request to the Google Safe Browsing Service and ask for a list of these hash prefixes. Um, it's going to get them back. And so these are, remember, these are basically um, uh, the beginning part of a hash that is a hash of a uh, suspicious URL. Okay? And so we're downloading a bunch of these. Now, um, remember, it's possible that uh, multiple suspicious URLs have the same prefix. Um, and it's also possible that non-suspicious URLs have the same prefix. Right? We've lost some information by chopping off the last part of this hash value. Um, but that's OK. But so now we have this list that I'm, I'm drawing it here as a box, uh, sort of to indicate that it's um, uh, we're going to be able to query it from the client, but this is sort of this is on your own computer. This is part of the browser. This this hash prefix list. This is sort of locally available to the browser. And so now we want to ask the question: Is a particular domain safe? Or in this yeah, in this case, it's a domain, but it, it, yeah, a particular URL is it safe? And so we put the uh, the URL through a hash function. In this case, SHA-256. We get out a value, uh, and now we're going to chop off the same pr sort of prefix length that Google did when it provided us this initial list, and we're going to look and see if it's in the list. Um, and so let's say that it's not in the list. Well, what do we know now? The deal was Google gave us this list of uh, every prefix of, a, of suspicious URLs that exists. So if we look up a specific prefix and it's not in that list, then we know it's guaranteed to be safe. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're going to answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is, like, this is sort of guaranteed to be safe because it's not in this list. Um, cool. So we know sort of quickly that it's safe. And so we can just, in, a, in, a, in the normal case, we can um, sort of quickly go ahead and load the, uh, load the URL that the user requested. Great. Now, what about in the case where it's not safe? So we have the same question, is, is it safe? We, we, we do the hash. We ask uh, about the prefix. And this time, we find that it is indeed in the, in the prefix list. So now we know it may be unsafe. Uh, so what do we do now? Well, yeah? We could send the full URL to Google, yeah. Uh, but remember, there, there is the potential that like, a safe URL actually has the same hash prefix. And so um, when that happens, we'll be, telling the, the sort of, we'll be telling the Google server the exact URL that we were attempting to visit. So we can do slightly better than that. We'll just uh, send Google the prefix uh, that, uh, we, that our URL that we're attempting to visit uh, starts with. And then it will send us back the entire sort of full hash list where all of these hashes that it sends back have the same prefix that we asked about. 
right? And so now we can take the full hash that we got out of uh, our SHA-256 function and compare it to this list. And if it's in the list, then we know that it's unsafe. Um, so how, now we have this new list. We ask if it's in the list. And then let's say in this case, it's not in the list. So now we know, you know, hooray, we have a safe URL. Um, cool. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I think that's, so you, your, your uh, I guess the alternative is you could download the entire sort of list of, of hashes, and then it's, it's going to be a little bit big, yeah. That's sort of the main advantage here. The downside of this is, I don't know if you can start to see, but basically we are kind of leaking some information to the central service. Like, it knows that we visited a URL that starts with this particular prefix, um, and, you know, so it knows it may be one of these, um, it may be one of the URLs that it, produce these hashes that it doesn't know about. It could also be some other URL that, that the service doesn't know about as well. But you know, maybe over time, the service can start to sort of, if it, if it wanted to, if it was behaving maliciously, sort of pay attention to the requests that come in from, from your particular IP address and sort of start to learn over time the kinds of things you visit. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, and then, so let's see what happens in the case where it's not present. I mean, this is, um, this is uh, pretty straightforward. So if it is, or sorry, if it is present, uh, in this list, and of course, uh, now we know that we, we indeed have, uh, have an unsafe uh, URL, and we, we want to warn the user. Mm -hmm. Just a quick last question, though. Didn't we talk about earlier that we can use whitelisting as a tool for blacklisting? So how does the whitelist tool for browsing sites continue to get updated while all this is happening? Because it's very possible to use whitelisting for all three sites if you don't have a single source. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, I, think, I think it's a trade-off where, I mean, if you attempted to, to, if you attempted to have a whitelist approach to sort of the URLs you're willing to visit, now you're, you're going to have well, not only will it be pretty large, but you'll also sort of you'll never be able to visit a URL that the service hasn't seen before. So it'd be kind of a, I mean, it, it may be actually a good idea if you're really paranoid and you have like you know, um, I don't know, reason to be to be paranoid or something like that. But um, <coughs> yeah, I think the trade-off here is that like. Uh, you know, there's URLs that all the time that are sort of dynamic. Like you can imagine a URL with the sort of query parameters that are that are like uh, uh, haven't been seen by the service. You can imagine uh, even in, you know another example would be um, some kind of a, a, a document where the uh, like a Google Doc where you have the the parameter indicating sort of um, a key that makes it so that only the people with that key can view the document. And for those types of URLs, again, like the service would not have seen those before. But yeah, it's, it is it is a really good point though. This is this is uh, an approach that is guaranteed to miss some cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so how does Google get the info um, of that site? So I think they uh, uh, the main way is people just report URLs. Like in Chrome, you can just if you go to a suspicious page, you can report it as a phishing page. Um, and uh, I think they also I mean they have a they have like a, a search engine crawler that's just constantly going around the web and. Uh, one, one, one thing that they do do is they have uh, sort of uh, uh, effectively imagine like a VM running like a really vulnerable version of Windows in it. And they'll, they'll uh, when they see a URL that may be suspicious, they'll open up like Internet Explorer unpatched or something in that VM, visit that URL, and then just see what happens to the computer, <laughs> basically. And if, if they, so they can sort of see what, what like what is this site going to do to the computer. And if, if, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if it's not in a sort of pristine state after visiting the page, then they can say, okay, this, this is a suspicious site, like it, it caused damage to this computer. Um, and then you can also imagine doing this for sort of every site that has downloadable files. Like if you see an executable file, like a, you know, maybe a program, you just download it and you run it and just observe what happens to the computer. And again, you can sort of see uh, patterns of the, the types of things that malicious programs would do. And uh, that's, that's another way they can add a lot of URLs to this list. Cool. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. How hard is it for malicious sites to randomly generate URLs to get around this? Yeah, yeah. So that's another great, great point I didn't put in the slides here. So you're right. Like, uh, if, if all it takes to, to avoid the list is to just tweak the query parameters in the URL, then, then you can imagine the site would just sort of generate random query parameters all day long. And so actually, when you send, uh, when you send your, uh, your, when you look up your hash prefix, you're not just hashing the URL that you're on. You're sort of, you're actually transforming it in a couple of different ways, and you're hashing all of those. So like one thing you'll do is literally just check the home page and see if that's in the list, right? And then you might also check like, say you're on, you know, sl uh, slash A, slash B, slash C. 
you might decide to chop off the slash C and try checking also slash A slash B. And then again, you might just check slash A. And so there's a sort of algorithm that uh, you can look up if you just if you Google this and look up their, their docs. And you can sort of see the, the, the general categories of URLs you check. But you are checking like around 10 or 20 different sort of uh, variants, including the sort of homepage. So if the homepage is reported as malicious, then you, you won't be able to go to any URLs on the whole site. It's really right. hard to like randomize the URL for your homepage. I mean, you can buy new domain names. But um, now there's at least a monetary cost where you have to like be willing to at least spend, what, five bucks to like. Uh, you know, uh, keep buying new domains. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, uh, so yeah. So that's that's really useful. So we we, we sort of th this is uh, like sort of a defense in depth uh, approach. You can think of it as sort of an extra layer of defense. If it doesn't work, hopefully the browser still, uh, you know, <coughs> excuse me. Hopefully the browser still um, protects you. But um, it's nice to have. Okay. So now I want to talk about side channel attacks. So, uh, so these are really cool. Uh, so these are attacks where you, you, um, you have a system that's functioning correctly. Like it's following the implementation, like there's no implementation bugs, but yet it still somehow leaks uh, sensitive information. So it's almost like it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with the lines of code that the programmer wrote, but yet in, in practice in the real world, there's something wrong with how the system behaves because an attacker can learn information that they shouldn't learn, okay? So, uh, so, so common examples of, of things that can cause side channels, uh, side channel leakage, is uh, timing things, right? So if, 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 if something takes a certain amount of time in one case and a different amount of time in another, but the system is like sort of not revealing to you, it's trying to sort of hide the difference between those two cases, but it takes different time and you can measure the time as an attacker, you can figure out what case the program is in. And let's just go into an actual example here to, 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 to see here. So this is, okay, so I have an example that is, that is uh, very much not related to web security, but it's really cool, so I, I thought I would show it. So this is a side channel attack uh, that you can, that, that uh, these MIT researchers showed that you could do in the real world. So let me set up the sort of threat model here. Uh, so our, our goal is we're trying to build a system which uh, we're trying to build a room, let's say, a, like a room where when we're inside it, we can talk and we can have a really secret conversation. And outside the room, nobody can hear what we say. Okay? So our constraints are no sound should escape. Right? So say we've decided we, we find this like really nice uh, glass material. Okay? It's really thick. And so we make a room out of this glass. And we say, you know, with our engineering hats on, we say, this room is impervious to sound escaping. So we go inside the room, we shut the door, we talk inside, and it's true. No sound is escaping. We have succeeded as engineers in making this room you know, impervious to sound escaping. But we made it out of glass. So the attacker can see through the glass. And the question is, like, is, is that a problem? Well, we designed it so the sound wouldn't escape. And, and so now the question is, can we somehow use the fact that we can see into the room to, to learn what conversation is going on? And so in this research paper, uh, here, I'll just play the video. It's, it's an amazing video. I, oh, that, that's the problem, though, is I don't have an audio cable. Um, so I, I will have to just turn up my speakers and hope for the best. Okay. When sound hits an object, it causes that object to vibrate. The motion of this vibration creates a subtle visual signal that's usually invisible to the naked eye. In our work, we show how using only a video of the object and a suitable processing algorithm we can extract these minute vibrations and partially recover the sounds that produced them, letting us turn everyday visible objects into visual microphones. In the silent high-speed video shown here on the left, we see the leaves of a potted plant shown on the right. The video was recorded while a nearby loudspeaker played the notes to Mary Had a Little Lamb. play the video in slow motion here, the vibrations caused by the music are so subtle that they move the plant's leaves by less than a hundredth of a pixel, making the plant appear still to the naked eye. But by combining and filtering all of the tiny motion happening across the image that you see, we are able to recover this sound. In 
our next experiment, we recovered live human speech from high-speed video of a bag of chips lying on the ground. <laughs> but to make things a little more challenging, this time we put the camera outside behind a soundproof window. This is what a cell phone was able to record from inside next to the bag of chips. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, that lamb was sure to go. And this is what we were able to recover from high-speed video, filmed from outside, behind soundproof glass. In this next so yeah, I, I could keep going, uh, but I think, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, I think the next thing that we're going to show is a video of headphones and just from like looking at the headphones they're able to pick up what was playing on it uh, which is I think they're just showing off at this point but yeah uh, where is it it's right here we recover music from high-speed video of some earbuds plugged into a laptop computer then we take our recovered sound and use audio recognition software to automatically identify oh, yeah. the song that was being played <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's a good enough for Shazam. So anyway, yeah. So this is this is the idea of side channel attacks. Uh, but yeah. So uh, we want to do this on the web. Um, and uh, but yeah, wasn't that really cool? That was super cool. And there's all kinds of there's all kinds of uh, real world side channels like this. There's uh, there's even stuff where uh, you can you can figure out what uh, a decryption algorithm is doing based on the power usage that uh, your your computer is is uh, like pulling from the wall, basically. So you can monitor the power line. You can sort of literally, like, in the power levels, pull the key out. Um, there's all kinds of, of, of it, some of this stuff's a little, uh, a little bit like theoretical and um, maybe, not, maybe not practical, but there's a really cool stuff um, in, in this area. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so, so yeah, let's talk about um, one uh, classic attack. Um, and this is almost, this is almost barely a side channel because it's so basic, but, um, but this is sort of the beginning of, of, of where we'll start. So there was, um, this was a sort of a, a really long-standing attack for many, many, many years. I think it wasn't fixed until 2010, um, where you could literally just create a link um, and stick the link into the, into, the, into the page and then check the color that the browser rendered the link with. And so browsers render visited links in purple and, li and unvisited links in blue by default. And so just by checking the color of the, of the link, you can figure out whether the user's been to a URL. So this is like pretty bad. If you, you can imagine like listing the top million sites in an array and then just sort of iterating through really quickly in the background, you can figure out what kind of sites this user likes to visit. So this is really bad. The problem is it seems kind of important to be able to like check style attributes of elements that are in the page. Like that's kind of a fundamental thing of, you know, about the way the DOM works. So what can we do here to fix this? Anyone have ideas? What should we do? What should the correct trade-off be? What, what, did the, what do you think the browsers did in 2010 when they, fi when they fixed this? Yeah? I don't think it's true, but you only turn to purple if you click on the, the from at site. That, that, uh, that's not the way it works, uh, but that, that, that's one possible solution. Um, and that's a really interesting solution, because what you're pr basically proposing is you're saying, if I visit uh, site A, and I click a link to site B from it, then it's pretty obvious to site A that I went to site B. I mean, they're, running, they're already running JavaScript on site A. They can see exactly what my mouse clicks on. They have all kinds of ways to detect what I'm doing on th that site. And so it's, it's, uh, we should just assume that they know I went to site B, right? And so uh, at that point, it's not, really a lot, it's not really that bad to just render the link in purple, because the site already knows, right? Um, whereas if I had been to site B before I came to site A, uh, then maybe we would want to render the link in blue. So there's no way for site A to know. Um, that was an approach that browsers considered, but they decided against it because of the usability uh, like downside, basically. It's, they thought users would be confused about why like, a link that they know they've been to is sometimes blue and sometimes purple on different sites. And so they threw that solution out. Any other ideas? Yeah. Oh, are you raising your hand? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Anyone have any other thoughts? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, say that again? Oh, just like make, make the color of links unviewable. OK, that's not a bad, uh, that's not a bad idea. But with, uh, with, with CSS, we can actually change the way that visited links look in many other ways besides color. Um, so we can, we can write a CSS rule that says that, uh, for example, when a link is visited, I want the background of it to be an image from my server. And so now, every time I visited a link, uh, or any time a link has been visited, I can uh, I will tell because my server got got a request for this background image, right? Um, but yeah, that is a good. If, if we could eliminate, um, uh, if we could eliminate these other ways, that that could work. Yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, instead of like making it so that after you visit a link, you change the color attribute, you could have a separate attribute that like changes the shade from like the previous color, and then just make that that one like unreadable. Hmm. Could you explain more? How, how would that work? Like you just have like, like a separate style that is like a separate attribute that's only like visited or non-visited. Hmm. And that one can have like a different rule for how you apply that on the client side, and you can just make it so that I guess like you can't read that on the on other sites. Yeah. So that could work, but I th I think given the given the thing I said about the CSS rules causing you know potentially causing like an image a background image to load, that still seems like a workaround to to your to your approach. If I understand it correctly, um, yeah. But but yeah. So it's it's a hard. Pro it's like pretty hard problem. Um, and so let's see what they what they tried to do. So uh, in 2010, uh, Mozilla finally. Uh, I think this was back when uh, when Firefox was sort of. Uh, I don't remember when Chrome came out, but um, but yeah, this was back when Firefox was 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 much more uh, prevalent than even Chrome. So they they decided to basically the goal was they said we probably just can't fix this entirely. What we should focus on trying to do instead is make it a lot slower for an attacker to iterate through all these URLs. So you might be able to check, maybe instead of being able to check 10,000 URLs that a user has been to per second, maybe we should make it so that you can check like 10 per second, and like that will be a that will be like our defense for like their v1 attempt at solving this basically. So they, they decided to do three things. Um, one is they restricted the set of CSS properties you can apply to visited links. So you can't cause, uh, you can't say when a link is visited, I want a background image to load because that leaks the fact that that link is visited. You can't change the position or the size of uh, a visited links either because if you could do that, then you could write JavaScript that would detect how the layout of the page has changed when this visited link, you know, when it's visited or when it's not visited. So you can make it like really wide when it's visited and then it will displace other elements on the page and you can find that out in JavaScript, right? So we just don't allow those things. Uh, so we literally, they literally had a whitelist of like, you can set the color of the link, you can set the, um, like, uh, what was the other things? I forget. Underline, um, bold, italic, that kind of stuff. Really sort of minimal changes to the, to the, to the text. Um, uh, then they also th they also changed sort of internal internally in the browser they had code paths where um, when you change a link from um, when you change the href of a, of a link it sort of goes through a, a code path that was really slow and people could time that and detect that it's a, a visited link so they sort of tried to make their code take the same amount of time whether the link is visited or not visited um, and then lastly they just this is the sort of this is the sort of obvious thing the code that we had on the other page where you literally just check the style in JavaScript. That's that that obviously is a is a workaround to all the things we've mentioned so far. So the the the, the thing they came up with here was let's just make this lie to the user. So when you when you ask what the color is, it'll always be the color of the un, the uh, unvisited links. So you literally can't get the the true color or any of the true sort of styles of links if they're visited. It'll just act as if it's unvisited when you check it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that sort of solves that problem. The problem is that this is sort of an incomplete solution. There's many other many other leaks that remained. So, um, so I want to show a, a demo now of uh, of something that actually still works, uh, and uh, you know it 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 uh, it's kind of wild that it works. Um, so here it is. So, let's see here. So, let me make this uh, window slightly bigger. And let me see, I'll do, I'll do this and I'll zoom into here. Okay, cool. So what we have here is uh, I visited, I just went and clicked on a few of these, uh, a few of these links so that you can see they're purple. But remember again, if, if the site were to try and check the color, it's gonna report that it's blue. Uh, what we're gonna do instead is we're going to, um, this page is going to, uh, so 
Okay, see, so how do I explain this? We're not allowed to set text shadow on visited links. One of the things about text shadow is it's actually quite slow to render a shadow, if you make, especially if you make the size of the shadow really big, like 500 pixels, because it has to sort of do, uh, do a wild comp computation to figure out sort of the diffusion of the shadow. And so like, you can literally, it'll take like, you know, a noticeable amount of time to draw something with a shadow that big. And so we can't set, we can't set that shadow on links. But what we can do is make, um, we can make all links including like visited and unvisited, have a shadow on them. And then we can make a link that starts off to a site we know we haven't visited before, like we make up a URL. And then we swap the href attribute on it and make it now point to a site we're trying to query. And the browser will redraw. Um, it will redraw it if its state has changed, even though it's going to look the same no matter what. And we can time that. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, so, and then to make it sort of, to make the timing effect even bigger, we're going to put like, thousands of links in the page, so that the time difference will be really big when this happens. So let me just click, click start and we'll see it happen. So basically what it's going to do is, it's timing the difference between this URL that it knows we haven't visited, and this URL that we, we clearly have visited because it's the URL that we're on right now. And it's, you'll notice that the one that we have visited is generally taking more time to load because it's triggering this redraw. So do you see these times here? Okay, so now it's figured out, it has enough confidence that it's going to try and guess which ones we visited. Um, so what, it, what it's done is it's sort of decided here, where does it say, median visited is 216 and median unvisited is 16 milliseconds. So basically, when we've not visited a link, it renders much faster than we have. And so it, de it decided the threshold to use is 166. And so anytime something takes uh, more than 166 milliseconds, it's going to assume we visited it. Um, and here you can see it detected we've been to these URLs. Uh, it failed on a couple of them, uh, which just shows the unreliability of this technique. So you can see, even though this was, an un, uh, this was a visited link, it took 83 and our threshold is 166. So it's not perfect. Um, but it's, it's like good enough for fingerprinting purposes. Um, and if I, I bet if I increased the, the, the text shadow to be even bigger, we'd get sort of more reliable results. Um, but yeah, does this kind of make sense, what's going on here? Yeah, pretty wild, right? It, it, it was able to sort of I mean, it also it clearly had no false positive. It didn't think I visited any of the ones that hadn't, I hadn't actually visited. So it's pretty cool. Yeah? I think this is an implementation-specific thing in, in Chrome. So basically what's going on is when they set the href attribute of a link, and it was, un, it was so it, was, it had a previous value that was an unvisited URL, and we set we change the href, and now it's a visited URL. The browser decides to go through a code path to redraw that uh, link, and we can t we can tell when that happens. Versus versus if we had set it to a, to a URL that was still an unvisited URL, then it wouldn't do that redraw path. And so the time the time sort of oh yeah, and the other thing too is how are we timing this? What we're actually doing to time this is it's using an API called Request Animation Frame, which is supposed to be used for used by video games to to, to sort of draw frames into the browser. And if the browser is occupied doing this redraw step, then that, uh, that function actually takes longer to, uh, to, to sort of call your, to, to tell you it's time to draw the next frame. And so it's like as if you like lagged, you lagged the browser out and you, you would have had a frame skip if it was a video game, but, but you're using it to just time, to time this. Um, anyway, the details aren't too important here. I just wanted to show that this kind of thing is still possible because this sort of is an inherently really hard problem to, to solve. It leaks, these kinds of leaks exist. Um, yeah, so, so let me continue. Uh, yeah, so, so basically, yeah, so one thing you could do to try and fix this is you could say we're going to ban um, CSS properties that affect rendering speed, like, like text shadow, like even on unvisited links, like just, just no styling of links, basically. <laughs> this seems like a, like a bad approach. Another idea is to double key the visited link history. This is the suggestion that you made about sort of um, uh, deciding whether to draw it as visited or unvisited based on the the site that you visited it from. So basically, if you go to example.com and you visit, uh, sorry, if you go to good.com and you click a link to example.com, then now example.com will be, will be visited when you're on good.com. Uh, but later on, when you go to evil.com, it will show up as unvisited. Mm -hmm. I really want to set the text shadow of my links. And 
somehow it's just not working and then I like qu- start questioning my knowledge of web development <laughs> as a whole. <laughs> like, <what? laughs> Yeah, no, I agree. In, ge- in general, when, when browsers attempt these mitigations, they'll, they'll um, try, they try not to violate, uh, like outright violate a spec, but when they do, they try to sort of get the spec changed so that, so that sort of the ground truth is the spec and you can say like, well, we did it because the spec said so, right? Uh, but, but if they can't get all the other browsers to agree, then they may decide to sort of just be in violation of the spec on their own if they feel really strongly about their change, right? But the way these changes happen is typically a browser will just ship the change and sort of see what breaks. And if like they don't get a ton of sites broken and users yelling at them, then they can go to the other browsers and say, hey, we shipped this to like all of our users and no one complained. Like you should do the same. And then they have a discussion about it. And that's kind of how, how things evolve. Yeah, it's very uh, uh, sort of ad hoc. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, oh yeah, and then the last one was sort of you could just completely remove the ability to style links. That, that would definitely fix this, um, this specter. <coughs> And so, yeah, one other way that images uh, can, uh, can leak stuff is uh, I mentioned before that, you know, when you, when you include an image using uh, an image tag, that the cookies get attached to this request, so your cookies for Gmail will get attached. And uh, one thing you can, you can imagine is maybe this link here is, is a, or sorry, this image here is a, is a button that Gmail is using to, sh- to sort of show, um, it's like the button that says log in or log out. Uh, but the state of this image will be based on whether you're logged in or logged out. So they're using one URL for this image, and they're going to look. The server is going to look at the cookie that's sent, and if it sees that you're logged in person, then it will. This will draw a logout button. This will. The server will return a logout button image, right? And if you're, uh, if you're, if you're uh, uh, already logged out, it will show login, right? Um, but like, say these, say these are slightly different widths. So if I want, if I as an attacker want to figure out whether you're logged in or not to Gmail, I can embed the image in my page, and then I can. Uh, I can detect how it affects the layout. So if one of the images is, is, is slightly wider than the other, then I can design a page where like, if, if, it, if, it, if it's slightly wider than something, sh- the layout shifts, and I can detect that, and then I can know that you're, you must be signed into Gmail, um, which might make my phishing page much more effective, because I can now show you a phishing page for Gmail instead of a phishing page for some other email service, right? So this is a, this is a violation of the same origin policy um, in, in some ways, because I'm learning that you're logged into Gmail when I shouldn't be able to do that. But uh, again, this is like not an intentional design decision, but it's just we're, we're leaking some information based on the size of the image here, and there's, there's not really a way around it. Mm-hmm. Wait, so how would the user retrieve this information? Or like the hacker? The attacker would put this image into their attack site, and then uh, they would set up the page so that uh, if, if this draws a sign-in button, uh, then they, they know that it's going to be 100 pixels wide, and so um, some text, that maybe they put some text over here next to the image, right? Well, and when it's 120, it shifts the text down, and they can tell that that happened. But won't they also need to know, like, isn't this image, if, if, if they're going to put this image on their website, don't they, also, don't they also need to see, like, isn't it dependent on whether their user is actually signed in, and therefore will they need to know this cookie? Or? So remember, the, the way that the browser attaches these cookies is when this request is made, it's going to just automatically add cookies to the request. Um, so if the user has cookies in their browser, and this request is going to this origin right here, then the browser is going to just add the cookies to it. Yeah. Um, now remember again, I keep this keep coming back to this, but same site cookies are really good because same site cookies would solve this problem. Um, if you had, if this was a same site cookie, then it wouldn't get attached to this request, and it would always appear uh, signed out uh, uh, when uh, the attacker embeds it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, remember, the attacker here is making an, a site like attacker.com, and they're trying to get a victim to visit it. Uh, and so the victim that visit it, visits it is logged into Gmail in their browser, and so this code is running on that victim's computer. And so we really need our JavaScript, our attacker JavaScript, to be able to look at the size of the image on that particular victim's browser. Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, so, oh, yeah, and so... <laughs> Uh, just a few more sort of uh, recent examples of, 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 of side channels, and then we're going to move on to, to our next topic. But uh, uh, these ones, I think, are just, just also just really cool. Uh, so this is, uh, th- there's an API that lets you detect the ambient light in a room. And for a while, this was uh, planning to, this was, the browsers were planning to just include this as an unpermissioned API so that any site could just sort of ask, like, what are the light conditions? 
in the room right now. Idea, me, idea being maybe that like if you're in a dark room, they could show you a dark theme or something. And if you're in a, like, a bright room, they could change the UI to make it brighter. You know, na native apps can do this. Right? Like your iPhone apps and your Android apps can detect the, the ambient light in your room without any issues. They just call an API and they get it. So why shouldn't a website be able to do it? That's, that's the idea. But uh, detecting whether the user's in a dark basement or in like a, like a bright outdoors place can actually cause some, uh, some issues. In particular, uh, we can distinguish between the color of a, of a user's screen. If they're in a, if they're in a, like a dark room, if we put uh, like white on the screen, we'll be able to pick that up with our ambient light sensor. If we put black on the screen, we'll be able to pick that up. Uh, or even, yeah, even colors are, are, are picked up by the, by the ambient light sensor. And so here's a video of a really wild um, use of this to detect someone's browser history. So what we're doing, what's going to go on here is they're, um, they're going to show uh, a white page and they're going to then wait a second and then read the sensor and see what does the ambient light sensor say about the conditions in the room right now. And then they're going to show a black page and they're going to read the sensor again. And that's how they're going to calibrate and know like, what the ambient light sensor reading is going to be in both of those cases. And then it's going to draw a link on the screen and it's going to use CSS and say, if this link has been visited, I want it to have a black background. And if it's not been visited, I want it to have a white background. And then just going to read the sensor reading out and then they're going to be able to sort of iterate your, your browser history. Um, so let's see it. Uh oh, here we go. Okay, so yeah, it's just going through like some different sites it wants to know if you visited, and it's just like looking at the light conditions in the room as it does this. Uh, and eventually, it will just tell you which. Yeah, these are the URLs you visited. Um, so, you know, you might say this is not very practical. It's sort of taking up your whole screen. Um, you're going to see that it's happening. Um, you know, may but maybe, maybe you could run this code when you step away from your device, um, you know, when, it, when your device becomes still. They can sort of just say, okay, go for it now. They're not in the room. Mm -hmm. Wait, then, would it, if, you're, if, you're, if you constantly browse on incognito, like, would most of these attacks just fail then? Or yeah, all the ones that involve your browser history, like, if you're, if you're, uh, uh, well, you know what? No, not if you're all in one incognito session. I believe the way that, that the way that incognito works is it doesn't actually clear your history until you close all incognito windows. Yeah. So, but yeah, in but general. Then, but then in incognito, when you visit a site, it won't like actually make you see a search bar, or like how does how would using light affect it if you're in the same incognito session? I, I think I think that if you're in the same incognito session, everything you visited in that session would all those links would still render as visited, I believe. Uh, but I'm not. I'm like not 100 percent sure. We'd have to. We could look that up. <laughs> but yeah. Mm -hmm. If you just put this like in the hello app, is it just search bar for the next browser history? Ah, okay. So basically, when uh, when oh, oh sorry, my, my shortcuts aren't working here. Um, okay. Yeah. So I can't remember if it's white or black that that visited or not. But let's say that uh, let's say this this rendered as white um, because we we wrote some CSS that says. Uh, this is, anytime there's a link that we've uh, we visited, we want it to have a white background, and otherwise it should have a black background. So while we're showing this, uh, this link on the screen, there's code that's looking at the sensor reading, and it's going to get a value back between 0 and 1. That's how bright is the room right now, right? where 1 is like the most bright. And so in that calibration step we did before, we, we, we determined that like when we showed black on the screen, maybe it was 0.3 brightness in the room, and when we showed white, it was like 0.6. And so now we know, like roughly, whenever we see a value that's 0.6, we know that white must be shown on the screen right now. And so this page would not be able to just ask what is the color of the of this link right now because it can't do that. But what it can do is read the sensor reading and know that it must be displaying as white because it's it's getting that from that sensor. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So it's a violation of the same origin policy. We shouldn't be able to find that out. And then here's a here's an even more. Uh, Potentially insidious example. So, so what, they, what they're doing here is this. This is an image of a. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, let me let me see if this is actually what I think it is. Yeah. Okay. So basically, what's going on here is there is a URL to a QR code, and this QR code contains sensitive information. It's like a, a key or something, right? And we're allowed to embed this QR code image. In, a, in our page because, you know, again, like images, you can load images from any, any site, right? And the cookies are going to get attached to it. So we get this image. It's in our page, but we're not allowed to read it as an attacker. We can't ask. We can't query the values. We can't get the pixels out of the image. But what we can do is uh, we can center, we can sort of zoom, zoom into one 
region of the image. And since it's a QR code, we know exactly how the image is laid out. It's going to be a set of pixels, right? So we can, we can uh, put the image in the page and then zoom it in so much that the whole screen is occupied by one square of the QR code. And then we can measure the light in the room, and we can get the value of that square. Is it black or white? And we can iterate through all the pixels uh, and then reproduce the QR code without being able to actually read it. And that's what this is doing right now. So as it goes through, it, as it detects the value, it sort of updates this little map down here of what it's read out of the QR code. <laughs> I just think that's so cool. Somebody thought of this and like wrote and coded this up. Uh, again, like I don't know how practical this is, but uh, but this is this is actually this gave the uh, gave browser vendors enough pause that they're like reconsidering whether to actually ship the ambient light API now or whether to maybe uh, uh, do some do some some steps to to potentially uh, make it less precise uh, or something. Any any questions about these? Cool. Okay. So yeah. So uh, here's another one. This one came out of Stanford in 2014. So a very similar sensor API, the gyroscope API, lets you detect uh, sort of the, you know, the orientation of your of your device. And that was an API which did ship and was shipping for a very long time, and sites could just call it without any permission prompt. And uh, basically, they figured out that the gyroscope was so was so so precise that you could actually pick up acoustic signals. And even if a site doesn't have microphone permission, just based on the way that the phone is moving, you can pick up what's being said in the room and reproduce it, which is completely wild. Uh, yeah, and uh, so the key point is that since iOS and Android require no special permissions to access the gyro, that means that any arbitrary website you're on could, could, could read the gyro and then figure out what's being said in the room and eavesdrop on speech in the vicinity of the phone. Yeah, <laughs> pretty wild. So, so uh, I think in iOS 13 or maybe it was iOS 12, uh, the gyro uh, the gyro API is now behind a, a permission flag, and so sites can't just read that anymore. Which is sad because as we as we keep locking up these APIs, it means that you know somebody who made a really cool demo of a you know website that you know changes based on your you know orientation that's broken now, right? But um, but yeah, I don't know trade offs. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, so yeah, these these attacks uh, may not be practical, but uh, but uh, they're they're still technically violations of the same origin policy. So we should kind of worry about them and 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 maybe think about whether um, we want to allow that or not. And then some mitigations might be to limit the frequency of sensor readings, uh, or to maybe just make the precision of the sensor output quantized so uh, so that it, the the user of the, the site can't get as much uh, a, a, as much uh, signal out of it. And so just to conclude the uh, this stuff on, on side channels and on, uh, on um, this kind of and phishing. So there's a tension between security and capabilities of the web browser. Phishing is a human problem. Um, and side channels are everywhere and really hard to prevent. So I'm going to go now to any questions before I move on? OK, I'm going to go on now to the actual topic of today. So now we're switching, uh, we're switching from, uh, from uh, Wait, why am I? Oh, there we go. Yeah, I'm switch, we're switching to code injections. We're switching to server side stuff. Yeah, question? Sorry, I was just thinking about the, um, the gyroscope. Yeah. Like, you would have a website where, like, you pretended the game and, like, you would need the gyroscope to play the game, but it also just, like, was linked with um. So, like, that doesn't really help anything. Like, the permission. Mm. Yeah, but you can at least make it so that when you're reading a news article, it's not, like, using the gyro. But, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're, you're totally right. I mean, that's, that's, that's also a problem in native apps, too, though, where, where a native app might actually have a legitimate reason to use your location, like, say, if it's a navigation app, right? But then it also turns out that they're using the navigation data of everywhere you go to target ads to you. And it's like, I proved my location for, so I could navigate around, not so that I could have this other use of the data. But like, it, once you've approved it, I don't know how you, you know, control what it's used for. Um, yeah. Cool. So let's move on to code injection. So this is uh, this is now we're shifting from the client side to the server side, uh, and so this is a whole type of new kind of attack. Um, so code injection is really cool. Code injection is uh, uh, is similar to we so, so we've already seen cross site scripting. That's one example of code injection, um, and the broad idea of code injection is again we're combining user supplied data that we can't trust with code that the programmer wrote, and uh, 
when the code that the interpreter processes is a mix of these two things, then it might basically it might get confused and uh, treat the uh, attacker supplied input as a command that that our programmer wrote. That that uh, you know uh, that so it has no way to distinguish what is user data and what is a command that we actually want to run. Um, and the attacker often does this by breaking out of the data context uh, using a quote or something like that, some kind of special character, some special syntax, uh, and now they're they're writing code. And then the attacker input gets interpreted as program, program instructions. So that's just review. So, so we're going to talk about one specific kind to start off with, so command injection. So command injection is, uh, our, our, the goal of the attacker here is to execute arbitrary commands on the operating system that the server is running on. Okay, so when we do command injection, we're going to, uh, we're going to be able to basically run effectively shell commands, terminal commands, on the server that we're attacking. And this happens, again, because we got some kind of untrusted user data from some source. It could be somewhere in the URL or a cookie or anything where the client sends data to the server. Because remember, the client can include whatever they want in, any, in their request. right? And the server now takes that and combines it into some kind of a shell script that it's going to run. And now, if we do it wrong, we're going to have um, the attacker controlling what, what shell command we run. <clears throat> so let's look at an example. So, so here we have some vulnerable code. So we pull off the first argument to our to this node program. So this is not a web example. This is just like a script, uh, just a simple script. So we're just going to read in a file name from, from the command line, and we're going to produce this command here. So we're going to cat the contents of whatever file um, the user typed in. And then we're going to log, log it out. So if we, if we type in file.txt, then the command that we produce here is going to be cat file.txt. Great, it works perfectly, right? Um, it's going to cat the file out. But what happens if the user types in this as their file name? OK. so you know, it's going to do a straightforward substitution, and we're going to end up with two commands separated by a semicolon, which in shells is, uh, is the sort of uh, ter statement terminator. And this is actually going to run a separate second command. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going, to lose our, we're going to lose all our files. <laughs> yeah. So not good. So let's, uh, let's see this in action. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to RMRF my computer. Uh, but yeah, well, let's, let's, uh, let's see what we can do here. So, um, okay. All right, so I'm just going to, okay. Okay, there we go. All right, uh, why is it doing that highlighting? Sorry, I need to just turn this off really quick. Okay, there we go. I think that worked. Okay, so let's pull pull in the file name. Oh, wait, I already have. I already wrote this code on the slide. I shouldn't be typing this up. This is. Uh, let me just copy it out of the slide to get us going here. Cool. Okay, so there we go. And so now, if I actually go here and I run cat.js and I say file.txt, it's going to print out some text. Hooray! Um, cool. Now, if I uh, let's see, what's a command I can do that won't destroy my computer in front of you all right now? LS. LS. LS yeah. Okay. Wow, that's cool. It worked. Yeah. So it LS and then it printed out the results. Another thing you can do is, if you want to creep out the person who's running the server, is you can say, "Hello, server operator." Hello, server operator. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. Another thing. Uh, yeah. So it was, so it's clearly working. Yeah. So let's let's uh, let's see. What what should we do here? So the, so. Here's like a more, a more realistic way that this might actually be used in a web app. So we might have some kind of an endpoint that comes from Express. Uh, so we're, we're going to make an Express app, and then we're going to create a route. And let's say that we have a home page, and the home page is going to have a form that lets people look up files. Uh, so we need to send back some HTML. We'll call this a file viewer. And we'll, let's see here, uh, we need a form. And the method is going to be, let's do get. And we're going to make our action be another route that we're going to implement called view. And this form can contain two inputs. The first will be a file name. And the next one will just be a button that we can push to submit this. So if we do that, and then we now implement that route uh, slash view, 
and we make it just pull the file name property that's going to come from the form off of the query object, and then we get the standard out. Child process dot exec sync is the way that you run commands, and we're going to be naive here and just sort of stick the whole file name directly into this command, and then we'll send the response, we'll send the standard out back to the user so they can see the contents of the file. Okay, and then I can delete this code down here, and I can also start the server up. And since I'm worried that one of you all is going to make a request to the server, I'm going to ensure that it can only listen on my local interface. <laughs> I don't want to receive any requests on the server. In fact, I should probably log out. No, it's fine. Um, okay, so, so now let's run this. Okay, and if I go to my browser now and I make request to the homepage, we get this file viewer interface, which is excellent. Okay, and then I can type in file.txt and it's going to serve me the file. Cool. Oh yeah, so again, so this is web exposed. The client is, is controlling what's entered into here, here into, this, into this input here. So we, we can't trust it. You know, they can do things like make a file called, uh, you know, attacker was here, which would be a very disturbing file to find on your server. Um, yeah, so, that, so that, that outputted this, but then it also created a file on the server. So if I, if I ls now, oops, if I ls now, we're going to see attacker was here exists. Yeah, so not good. <laughs> Yeah, so, so let's, uh, let's fix this up. So what we need to do is we need to, uh, where's, the, where's the file? Here it is. What we need to do is not just blindly concatenate the, the user input into this command that we're going to run in our shell. We want to escape it correctly. And so for that, there's a different function we need to use here called spawn sync. And this is going to be different depending on the programming language that you're using. But the key idea is you don't want to be producing a string that's a combination of commands and user input. You want to you want to use uh, a function that can go ahead and escape the user input for you and produce a string that is safe. So what we do is we change this and we say cat is the name of the program we want to run, and then we give an array of arguments like this. Uh, let me see. Does this, is this, does this make sense to people, what's going on here? So we're telling it very explicitly, run cat, and this is an array of arguments, and uh, now, this spawn sync function is responsible for taking these arguments, which may be completely untrusted, contain quotes, contain semicolons, can contain all kinds of attacker-controlled characters, and it's going to escape them and then produce a final string that it's going to run. And uh, it's going to ensure also that no semicolons are in there um, uh, because uh, this sort of promises you that it's just going to run cat and nothing else, right? Does that make sense? Cool. So now if I run this, uh, let's see, uh, do I need to restart the server? I think I do. Yeah. Okay, so I restart the server, and now if I go back here and I run the same command, uh, actually, let's run a different command. Let's run ls and see what happens. Wait, what? It looks like it ran it, right? Yeah. Well, that's not good. Uh, oh, I didn't save. Yeah, I didn't save. Okay. Now we're getting back an object. Interesting. Uh, Oh, I think I know what. Uh, the interface is different here. So this uh, function actually doesn't return a, a buffer of the standard out. It actually returns an, a, a child process object. And so what we want to do is actually, we want to say, basically, so we want to check and see if the program ran successfully or if it crashed. And so if it, if it crashed, then it'll, it'll have a status of non-zero. And in that case, we want to send back the output of standard error to the browser. And then otherwise, let's just send back what we were sending before. And so child.standard out. Yeah. OK, so now if I refresh, we should get more and more useful page here. There we go. So see what it tried to do? So it produced a, it effectively asked cat to, to cat out a file called file.txt semicolon ls as the whole file name. And so cat tried to find a file named that, and it couldn't find that. So it worked, it worked as we expected. Now, there's, there's a huge other gaping problem that I'm not going to talk about with this, this, uh, this approach, but like, what, 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 is, what is another problem here that like, we haven't fixed, even though we've escaped the user input? Yeah? Dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, 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 slash, et cetera, slash, after. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the whole, the whole thing we're doing here is kind of a ridiculous thing. We're letting the user pick any file on our computer that they want to view. So uh, it's not just letting them view the, the sort of current folder we're in. So I, I don't know exactly what file I should type in here to show you, uh, but let me try, like, let's see. Um, yeah, maybe we can go up and view the lecture 
the lecture notes. So lecture10.md. Yeah, there you go. Those are all my, those are my those are my slides basically in text form. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So basically, I mean, nothing's going to protect you if you're if you're letting the user like at the end of the day, the command that you're producing is is a bad command that you don't want to run. Then you're still in trouble. But the difference here is at least now we know that they're not tacking on additional things to cat. That's what we've protected against. Does that make sense? Okay. Cool. Nice. So basically, in Node, um, and of course, this is going to be different in all kinds of different, uh, you know, whatever language you're using. But it's, there's a very, very similar functions in Python and in Ruby and in all the other programming languages. But basically, you need to know uh, that there's usually one way to do it that's insecure, where you're producing this string, and then there's another way where you sort of give it a list of arguments, and then you have it do the escaping for you, and then you're you're in good shape. It's the important idea here. Cool. So now we'll talk about SQL injection. It's another code injection attack. It's a, it's sort of very similar. All these things, you know, once you learn how to do one of these things, it, they're all they're all kind of similar to each other, right? You're combining user input with with code, and then you're you're getting sort of unexpected effects. So this is the same thing. Um, so uh, the difference here is that we're trying to query a database, uh, and so this is you, you know you can imagine a web app that is designed to um, get requests from users, and then it like looks stuff up in the database, and then it produces an HTML page, um, and if the attacker can, can change what the query does, they can do any of these things, right? They can do anything that a SQL query can do, including reading any of the data from the database, modifying the database, uh, doing administrative operations on the database, like deleting tables and things like that. Um, and even sometimes they can just shell out and actually just like run commands on the, on the operating system. And from there, they can, they can do anything, right? They, they took over the server, they can attack other servers, can steal all the data. It's game over. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so let's go back to our example of uh, the, the bank site that we've been building. And uh, let's, let's see if we, so let's say we wanted to add uh, an actual database to it to store our users and passwords. So we might have some code that looks like this, where uh, we're going to let the user, in, this is the login route, so the user is submitting the login form, and we're going to take the username and password that they typed in, and we're going to look up uh, and see if that user exists in our database. So we, we, we have a SQL query here, and we're just going to sort of stick the username into the query. Um, and then we're going to query the database. And this function here just returns a list of rows. So all the rows in the database where this uh, predicate was true. OK. Now, if there was more than one result, that means that that user must ex exist. And hopefully, there's only one result. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, basically, the user exists. And then at which point, we may decide to check the password uh, against what the user typed in. And if it, if it matches, then we go ahead and, and authenticate them in. Okay. And so, of course, this is vulnerable for the same reason why the, the command injection was. We're, we're taking this sort of SQL uh, query template, and then we're sort of in, in inserting uh, user-controlled uh, input. And so you know, in the normal case, it's fine. You know, the user types in for us as a username, and it, of course, it produces a, a valid query. But what happens if the user types in for us double quote? What is this going to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, syntax error. Yeah, you have you have you have two quotes. It's inv invalid. So one good way to test if a site is vulnerable to SQL injection is just add quotes to things. <laughs> if you can cause a, an error to show up, then it means like adding a quote should not cause errors, right? It should just be treated as part of the user's input. If you see a different behavior when you add quotes, the server is probably vulnerable in some way to SQL injection. Um, so so that's very that's very indicative here. The server returned an error returns an error now. So now let's say we we decide to investigate further. So we need to now uh, per fix the syntax error. We don't want to have a syntax error. That's not useful to us. So uh, in SQL, there's a way to comment, which is dash dash. And then everything after the dash dash is ignored. So say we changed our query to quote dash dash. Then now we've sort of get, gotten rid of this, uh, this other quote here. And now we're back to sort of a valid query. Um, but we didn't accomplish anything yet. But that's OK. Now what we'll do is add in a predicate, which is always going to be true. So what does this do? This query is basically saying, select any user where their username is for us or true. So it's going to select every user in the database. Because or true is always going to be true. It's going to make the whole condition true, right? And so this returns the entire, uh, entire database. And uh, let's see, what did I do here? Uh, I'm trying to, oh, right, right. And at this point, there's no need to even include for us anymore. We can just make this an empty string. So if we chop the for us part out, then we get 
just username is nothing, and this doesn't matter because it's always gonna, we're gonna select everything. So we, make a, we, have, we have a nice little attack uh, string here. And this is a very, very common, like this is the most common way to test if a site is vulnerable to SQL injection. You just, that's, that's the string to use. Mm -hmm. So why do you put the final uh, comment in quotes? So we didn't add this quote. Remember, um, the template's saying that it's gonna insert username between this quote and this quote, right? And so our string is gonna get stuck right, right in there, right? And so um, we don't want this trailing quote here, and so we just do a dash dash, and then it makes everything after it uh, inert. Yeah. Cool, so now what the server code is gonna do is when it gets to the line here where, uh, where is it? Uh, this line, so here we actually now have all the rows in the database, and so this result will always be true. Um, and in this case, we can't really do, do too much with that, but, uh, but depending, on, depending on what the site does once it collects these results, we can, um, you know, we might be able to see, for example, what, uh, what it actually selected, like see the entire user database or something like that. Uh, yeah. And so here's another thing you can do. So you can actually tack on additional queries if you add a semicolon, just like with command injection. So this is a really mean thing to do. If you do semicolon, or quote semicolon, we've now sort of ended the username query. So this is maybe gonna select no users, right? We, you know, select the users who have no username. So this is gonna be, this is gonna do nothing. But then we, we, we add it on. Oh, and by the way, delete all the users. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is pretty bad. Um, yeah, so let's, let's see some of this in action. So I have a little uh, server I wrote here to do, to do this. So, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna copy some code in. So there's, let's see here. Oh yeah, let's go back to our bank server. Okay, so we have our bank server and we have our users database that was an object. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that and I'm gonna add in some code for a real database. Um, okay, so all this code is doing is, it's not that big of a deal, but what it's doing is basically we're using SQLite here, which is a database that exists in a file on the computer. And it's gonna open up a new database and then I'm just gonna say every time you do something in the database, every time you run a query, just print it out so we can look at it until we know what's going on. And then I'm also going to just initialize the database with some data here. So I'm just gonna make a user's uh, table with uh, spots for username, password, and bank balance, and uh, some other things. I'm gonna insert some users into it. Um, and then when we close our process, I'm just gonna close the database. So no, no, nothing too fancy here. Now the, the interesting part is here. So we're gonna change the way our login works. So now instead of looking up our users in this object, we actually need to query the database. So let's write a query using a string here, select everything from users where username equals quote username, and this is the value the user typed into the form, and let's make it, make it also match, only match if their password is correct. And this database is very insecure, it has the passwords in plain text, I apologize, but uh, that's okay for now. And now we actually need to execute this query. So we're gonna do db.get query. And what get does is it's really nice. It ensures that this uh, query will only return one item. So if it returns multiple items, it just takes the first item that matches. There should only be one user with this username and password in the database. Okay, so we're gonna call that and then we're going to, it's gonna give us a call back when uh, it's finished getting the data, and so we're gonna say, if there was an error, like the database wasn't working, or uh, no, no user match. So in other words, the row, the database row that was returned, no row was returned. So in other words, it was an invalid username and password. If either of those ca cases happen, we're going to tell the user that they failed. So we're gonna copy this code that we used before and just say, say you failed um, to log in. And then otherwise, they successfully logged in. So we will go ahead and just include all this code from before. So we'll go ahead and give them a session ID, give them a cookie, and then redirect them to the homepage. So now they're logged into the bank. There we go, so that's great. So now we should test it. Let's, uh, let's run the server. What happened? Missing a paren after argument list on line 74. Where, where is this quote going? What was it? Uh, so this, I need that, like that, or what? Oh yeah, it looks like it worked, okay, cool. All right, so, uh, so it, go ahead, and went ahead and ran some queries uh, because 
it, we want to run those queries to sort of create the tables and the users and stuff initially. And so, uh, and so now our database is initialized. I can actually open up this app here, and we can we can open up the database and just look and just make sure that it worked. So, I'll just open up that database file, and we can see our users table. If I browse browse the data, there we go. We have we have some users in our database there: Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Um, cool. And then now we'll go to the browser, and we'll actually try to log in as Alice. Password. Hey, it works. Cool. Uh, and that that uh, you know that checked against the password here in the database. Excellent. Okay, so let's log out, and let's try some other things. So let's try a query, Bob, quote space dash dash. So if I, if I hit that, what's going to happen? Okay. Oh, you know what? Um, there's one. Yeah, that's a bug. But there's there's one thing I need to change. I forgot to change one thing here. This should be row.username. Sorry about that. Okay. Now if I try that again. So Bob quote dash dash. Okay, I got into Bob's account by typing that in, and I, I left the password field completely blank. Um, so what actually happened there, if I go to our terminal and I look at the query that was submitted, here, let me make this bigger. There we go. So the, the query that was submitted was select, uh, select all the columns from the user's table where the username is Bob, and that's it. <laughs> Just select Bob. And then I'm, I'm, I'm Bob. Right, so it matched. Great. So that's really bad. Another thing we could do is, so that's going to log us into Bob's account. Let's try a different thing. Let's try to log into just any like random account in the database. So we'll end the username and we'll do or one equals one. And so this is going to match uh, every row in the database, like I said before. But because we're using db.get, that ensures we only select one item. So it's just going to take the first user in the database. So this will log us into the very first uh, or not. Oh, yeah, dash, dash. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. So now I'm logged in as Alice. And if we look at the query that was sent uh, to the database, it was uh, you know, very similar. It was basically select uh, where the username is, is whatever or true. So it's going to select everything, and we're going to get logged in as Alice. Another evil thing we could do is try to just log into like, a user who's loaded. Uh, so <laughs> we could say or balance is greater than a million. And we're going to just log into the first account. Oh, I need the dash dash again for the comment. Yeah. But now if we do that, I log into the, to a user who is interesting to me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool. Uh, OK, so that's, that's, that's nice. But so one, one, one thing we can't do, by the way, is we can't actually run additional commands. Like I mentioned before, you could actually tack on additional query, queries by using a semicolon. If I try to do that, let's see what happens. So I do quote, uh, quote, paren, semicolon, and then update. Let's try to change some user's password. So I'm going to include a completely different query here. Update the user's table and set the password to root where the username is Bob. So I'm going to try and update Bob's username here. So does that make sense? Let me just run it, and we'll see what was on here. OK, it failed. It didn't even, it didn't even parse it. Um, so essentially what happened is uh, the, code, the code we wrote here uh, that calls get is smart enough to know that this because we're literally trying to get a single user, it doesn't make sense that you would never put two queries in here. So it's just protecting us. It's saying, you put a semicolon in there, we're not going to run it. Um, the thing is, though, not all, of the thing, not all of the APIs exposed by this library do this for us. In particular, there's one that um, users very, may well use called exec, which does support taking in multiple uh, queries. In particular, one thing that, that the developer here might want to do is say they want to just log every time a user attempts to log in. Maybe they have some security system that's going to audit these logs. So let's just, every time a user tries to log in, let's just add an entry into a table that logs the fact that they attempted login. So we'll insert into a logs table the values. Uh, and then in this case, we're just going to have a single value, um, login attempt from username. OK. So and we're just going to run that sort of right away when they attempt to log in, and then, uh, and then we'll continue to do the rest of the code just like normal. OK, so now if that was the code that they had, um, and then I, I pasted in that, that, that same code from before where we're trying to update Bob's password, um, so it's going to tell me I failed, but notice what it did here. So it, it actually ran, uh, it ran two commands, and it actually parsed them as two commands here. So it ran insert into logs value login attempt from and then this is my username, right? That's what I typed into the username box. So it logged like it logged login attempt from no one, 
into the logs. And then it, up, it sets the password to root where the username is Bob. So I just, I just changed Bob's password. And so now if I, if I go and I now try to log in as Bob, root should be his, his password. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty cool. So you can tack on additional uh, arguments. And then if you want to be really evil, you, you do the thing we, we said before where you drop table. So you end, you, end the, uh, you end the thing and then you type drop table <laughs> users dash dash. Oh, thank you, yeah. You do that, then, uh, yeah. So, so it ran two commands, login attempt from blank, and then goodbye, out of business. Uh, and so now if we actually go to our, our database viewer here and I refresh the data, uh, oh yeah, so our logs just show some suspicious activity. And then, uh, oh yeah, we don't even have, a, we don't even have a, a user database anymore, so I can't show you. <laughs> yeah, not good. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's some, some SQL injection. Now there's this classic XKCD I have to show you. If, you, if you're not aware of this, you have to see it because it's, it's like cultural security stuff. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty good. Little Bobby Tables. Yeah, so, uh, okay, so let's see. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna have time to explain this, man, I was running out of time. Um, I'll try. I'll try to see what we can get through here. So, uh, so, so that's SQL injection. Now, in the case that we just went through here, we we had a kind of we, ha we had it kind of easy. Where basically, if we were able to match a particular user, if we were able to make the the predicate true, then we were logged in as that user. But what if the server is vulnerable to SQL injection, but it doesn't actually show us the value of the query that it uh, like it doesn't show us the result of the query that it ran. So we're injecting into that query, but we can't actually, it seems like we can't use it to, to sort of print anything out of the database. It's, it's not getting us anything, right? There's this thing called blind SQL injection that lets you uh, s s uh, basically ask true false questions. You can ask, ask a question and then you get a yes or no answer. And if you ask enough questions, you can figure out uh, like anything from the database basically, but you have to be creative and patient in order to do it. Um, so uh, there's two types of this. So the, the, the easier type is where basically you can somehow cause the page to respond differently depending on if the query matched something or it didn't match something. Uh, so maybe if, if it matches something, you know, it returns an array of things and the, um, the code was expecting maybe a single value, uh, like a, a one item, and so then you get, a, you get the, server, the server crashes. Then in the other case, the server doesn't crash. Well, now you sort of know whether you match something or not. And you can, you can tell basically whether you got an error page or whether you didn't get an error page, uh, what happened, right? Uh, and so, so you can sort of, that, that query is sort of a yes, no question and you get an answer. And the other kind, which is even harder, is you do time-based attacks. So basically, you wanna make the database pause for some amount of time when your question is, tr is the answer to it is yes, and when the answer to it is no, you want it to return immediately. And if you measure the time difference, you can sort of uh, get an answer to your yes, no question. Um, so let's look at an example of this. So, here we have, uh, this is our same query from before, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask a, a yes, no question. I'm gonna say, so I want to log in as Alice, but I don't, uh, I'm sorry, I don't wanna log in as Alice. I actually wanna find out Alice's password from the database, right? And the thing that makes this hard is the page doesn't have a built-in way of, of printing out, like it, it has no functionality for printing out Alice's password, right? So it's hard to sort of uh, uh, do a SQL injection that will, got, will cause it to print, to, to print that out. So what we can do instead is we sort of, we ask a question, we say, and we wanna do a substring on Alice's password and just select the first letter of it and say, is it equal to the letter P in this example? And so that's gonna produce this query. So we're gonna select, we're gonna select a user from the database who's named Alice and whose password starts with P, okay? So if this is true, then we will have selected Alice. If, if, if Alice's password doesn't start with P, then we'll, this will be an empty array. We won't have selected any user, right? Now. I told you that the result of what we've selected is not being included in the output of the page in any way, right? So, so we can't actually use the result here. What we somehow need to do is make it, when this is true, that it takes a certain amount of time, a long time, and when this is false, it runs really quickly, okay? So how do we do this? Uh, yeah, so this is what I already said here. Uh, basically, we can't observe the difference in the page output. So what we need is a slow SQL expression, something that just takes forever. In this case, we can just make a huge, blob, turn it into hex string, and then uppercase it, and then compare it uh, 
see if it see if this string is present inside this, and then when that whole thing is done, compare it to some number. Um, <laughs> if we do this, this takes like a third of a second, a noticeable amount of time. Uh, and so then what we can do is we can use an if statement in SQL. We can say basically take some expression, and when it's equal to this, then we do a slow thing. Otherwise, when it's not equal to that, we do a speedy thing. Okay, and then based, based on timing, how long it takes, we can answer this yes/no question. So let's put it all together. So here's what we get. We say the question is basically, uh, is, uh, is the first letter of Alice's password P? If it is, do slow thing. That's all this crap. And then otherwise, do nothing. Okay. Uh, and then that's our query. And so I want to run it really quick, and we can see what happens. So uh, it's quite cool. So where is it? Um, okay. Give me one second here. Okay. All right. So now I go to the bank site, I refresh, and now I'm going to paste in this query, and I'm going to start it with Alice. Okay. So that's the that's the whole query that was on the slide. Now if I push login, uh, that was. Oh, my database is empty. Yeah. I need. To, <laughs> <laughs> good point. Yeah. Thank you for catching that. Okay. Okay. So uh, basically, the, the the timing here is what's really key. So I actually wrote a script that I can uh, just run that will just show you this in action. So wh basically what the script is doing is it's attempting every letter, and then when it sees a slow response, it knows that, uh, that it must have, been, that must have been that letter, and then it uh, goes ahead and tries like letter two in the password. And so uh, I can post this code on Piazza if you want to take a closer look at it, but it's, it's sort of just iterating through uh, and trying everything. So let's, uh, let's actually run it uh, and see what happens. So, <laughs> Basically, what it's doing is it, it's trying every letter in the first position, and then when, when it matches, it's going to take a little bit longer. And so the timing is on all, these, on all the other letters that were wrong was basically instant. And then the timing when we hit P, right, where was it? Uh, the very first match was P. So right here, P. This took like a third of a second. And so we're like, aha, it's P is the first letter. And then we just kept sort of uh, adding, you know, uh, uh, adding letters, trying, trying other letters, and then we sort of assembled the password. Uh, and this works, you know, it doesn't matter how secure your password is. If I type in Charlie here and we do it on a much more secure password, you'll see that, you know, there's no complexity increasing here. We're just sort of, it, we're just asking about each letter. And so, you know, just based on the timing difference here, um, we're getting sort of the whole password out, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think we're definitely over time here. So thanks for, uh, thanks for sticking with me, and I'll see you all next week. Bye.